Good morning, everybody. I'm live. Good morning. I've got to know right off the bat, we've done a speed test this morning, but am I pixelated? That was so stressful yesterday. I hate it when something comes up spontaneously like that, that disturbs our, our show. Good morning, Donna. Good morning, Crystal. Record-breaking temps in Halifax, plus 20 Celsius. The sun is shining bright. You deserve it. I'm so glad. Good morning, Doreen in upstate New York and Joelle in Calgary. I love the idea for your rug that you're going to put into the book. Um, thank you. Good morning, Beverly. You've been posting some beautiful things on the Facebook page. I love everything. Good morning, April and Linda from New Jersey. The sun is shining. Good morning, Penny. Morning to everybody. Rally 79. That is warm. That is warm. That gets into complaining weather for me again when it gets that warm. It's like, whoo, you know, sweating it out. Um, good morning, Linda H. in Massachusetts. Good morning, Mom and Granby. Hope things are good there. Good morning, Betty. I would like to email you. Where can I find your address? Uh, my email is um, ribboncandyhooking at gmail.com. So ribboncandyhooking at gmail.com. So hopefully that's an easy one. Let's see. Renee. Oh, there you are. Steamboat Springs. I haven't seen you in ages. Good morning, Chrissy. Ready for coffee time. Good morning, Brandy in San, San Augustine. I've, oh, Texas. I have not been there. I would really like, there's so many places when I see all these places pop up that um, I would love to get to. You know, when I used to be a tour guide, I went, I traveled 35 weeks of the year, but you didn't get to go where you wanted. You got to go where the itinerary took you. And of course you couldn't deviate uh, except for those occasional days where you get one day off and you can rent a car and take off, but hardly ever. So it left me with tons of holes in my map of places. Good morning, Glenn. Good morning, Patrice. Oh, you got on. Good job. You figured it out, right? You got the time off the page and you got on. That's great. Uh, Patrice has got some beautiful stuff. I just bought something. I'm looking forward to getting a nice old pattern. Good morning, Carol. I'm so glad you figured it out too. I can just see you smiling right now. I love that smile. Good morning, Lavana from um, Northwest Georgia. Um, good morning, Lulia from the Netherlands. Oh, I was born in the Netherlands, as you probably know. We lived there for many years and both my kids were born in the Netherlands. We lived in Amsterdam. I was born in The Hague in Schreven again. And then we moved to Zondijk to get the quieter life, which it wasn't. And then, I, and then I had my fill. And I'm very happy to be back in the US, but still love the Netherlands, of course. And when you're born somewhere, your heart is always partly there. Um, good morning, April. Good morning, Olivia. Good to see everybody. So it looks like today, hopefully, fingers crossed, I shouldn't even say it out loud, it's gonna be okay. Uh, Cause I was so pixelated. <laughs> I was so pixelated yesterday. I'm still coming down off of it. When I looked at the playback, it was pretty fierce, at least for me. Um, a little bit out of focus, more than a little bit out of focus, but uh, a bit like um, um, 1960s type, you know, whatever. But here I am. And let's do the material that we meant to do yesterday. I want to do a little bit of business first. I want to show you um, that I finally drew out the mat I was talking about, the, the Santa mat. So I'm going to be hooking this one. When I make patterns for you, I always give you a huge border, like four inch border or more. Good morning, Carol. Okay, great. Um, so, but on mine, I always do little ones because I find the smallest scrap that's like uh, languishing and I use it. So ignore the border. I'm going to hook it this way because I'm a beast with materials, but this is the Santa mat, which I think looks so good. And I'm going to make a plaid background. That's why I gridded it out. This is a mistake right here. Of course, I was... Um, very focused on my audiobook. There was like a 12th murder and I got completely distracted with the pen, but it's okay because I'm going to hook this one. So this is going to be Santa Matt that my mom drew. And this year, I'm sure, I'm not sure about Teddy, um, but I think Jossie's probably going to put the plate with the cookies down, put some carrots out for the reindeer up on the roof and the little uh, hot milk or something for um, you know who. So that'll be nice. But I thought that was a beautiful design. I'll get that on the page today. Thanks, Crystal. Try for the... Oh, okay, you're gonna try it, perfect. Today I will try for the first time needle punching. Exciting, I wonder if it's the Russian needle punching that's the teeny tiny stuff or if it's the big needle punching that you put yarn through or wool strips. Um, either way, that'll be amazing. Linda, she is super talented, she is. And she's got a few more uh, pictures going. Really, really iconic type winter scenes that I'm going to love putting up. So hopefully I get to that today. 
What is the size of the wool strip you recommend? Um, for, for which project, for like the Santa, for the, if, if we're talking, let me know if you're talking about something different, but for the Santa project, I think this is 18 across the big way. So it's not huge. It's like the size of a, a little bit bigger than a placemat. Um, I would recommend with all these small lines, um, if I kit it, I would probably kit in a combination of eight and five. Um, if I was just getting the pattern and I was doing it at home, I, I would ideally do an eight and a five. I could see, you know, I wouldn't do it in like a three because it's so graphic. It doesn't need a ton of shading unless that's your style and, and you want to do that. I would do it ideally between like a five, six, seven, that kind of thing. I would only use an eight in the background where I do the plaid and I'm gonna have to figure out how to do the plaid. That's gonna take some brain power. So I'll have to shut the mystery books off. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of fine detail in here too. So that's where I'm using the thinner ones. I would say I would do it with yarn, but I think this one will look better in wool strips. Can you use wool strips um, to punch number three, number four? Um, Patrice, you can if you have the, um, like Amy Oxford, that's the regular because the Amy Oxford fine, that comes in fine or regular. The fine one is really fine. So I use the fine one for like sock yarn, um, you know, really thin yarn. Um, I don't use that one for strips, but I use my regular for thin strips and thicker yarn, like up to a bulky yarn. Um, so it depends on which of the two you have. They have different numbers that relate to the height of the pile that you will make with that uh, punch needle. Um, no, this is a bad thing to say, but nobody needs all of them. I know they sell all of them as a set, unless you are um, a maniac for being complete. Um, you know, the, the pile height is not super different from one number to the next. It's nice to have maybe two or three different ones. I like having a fine and a regular. For me, I like a low pile. Having said that, I have to show you something else I've been working on. Um, you know, I do these latch, latch uh, kits, not once a month, but as often as I can, because there is a big audience for latch. And for people who are in the rug hooking business, you ought to know that there is a big audience for uh, latch. And it's not really a US market, but it is a big market. So I do a lot of stuff on like eBay uh, and Etsy with latch stuff. And it's not for everybody. Good, you've got pants on. Sometimes Teddy walks by and he's just, you know, he's warm no matter what the weather. Don't have one yet. Um, okay, so Patrice, I would recommend maybe like for me, the one I use the most is like a 14 um, regular. Um, but I also have a 14 fine and I love them both. But I would start with a regular so you have a few more options of things you can put through it. The reason I go to my fine punch needle so much is because I was I was doing tons of knitting before, not so much now with busyness and homeschooling. But um, I have like a shameful amount of um, sock yarn and like lace yarn and that kind of really thin yarn. So because of that, I now like to use it for my rug hooking because it justifies the extraordinary expense um, of having bought all that stuff and basically hoarded it for years. So if I didn't have that huge shameful stash, I probably um, would use my regular more, but I use my fine a lot for really thin stuff. I think it is more realistic in terms of like wanting to put wool strips through or bulky, bulkier yarns through that will punch a lot faster. It's so pretty, like a Claire Murray look, like a, you get a nice little knobby knob on top of each uh, loop. It's not a loop anymore. It's like a little pom-pom. Um, looks really nice with the regular. So if I was getting one right now, I would get like a maybe a 12, 14 regular. That would be my pick. So I was working on my latch thing. You know, I think I showed you this a while ago because Lily on our page always, always asks me about the, hello, Anita, always asks me about latch. So I came up with this treetops thing that was a bit like mucha, Art Nouveau, very, very simple. And um, I have a bunch of, I always do hand dyed wool for the latch hook. So I've got stuff like this uh, for the trees. I didn't want to do winter stuff yet. As soon as I get into the snow, with designs, I, I don't think I'll be able to come out until the spring. So I did one more of a tree with some green and some color in it. But these are all hand dyed wools that I hand dyed for the latch. I don't fool around, you know, I'm not against acrylic and stuff, but um, I don't fool around with um, like not luscious wool for latch because with any anything, it's just so nice to have a nice quality thing. I keep it in my little bowl with my latch hook. And for those of you that don't know, um, that are just at the beginning of your, people say journey, through the craft of hooking or rug making. A latch is, a, looks a lot like a rug hook, but it has this toggle. So every time you put your piece, you know, I go like this. Some people do it at the end, but I go like this. And then you go through the uh, netting and you come back up and it pops it up and you end up, um, that was wrong. You end up hooking it 
um, it was that's wrong. I need the netting to do it. But if the toggle locks it and you pull it through and it makes a double tuft, which is really nice. But this is the way it's coming out. If you're curious about, okay, so you'll have three colors of wool. Yeah, make sure you post so we can see what you're up to. I have a lot of sketches. Oh my gosh, you're really working on it hard. Definitely post, um, put your Instagram, if you're on Facebook too, put your Instagram on the Facebook page, uh, Rug Hooking and Punch Needle Club so we can all see how your punch goes. You're starting today, the maiden voyage. Exciting. But this is how, ju I just did one top um, of the tree so far, but it's gonna be a real heavy pile with the latch. And I've got the blues in the background and lots of colors of green in all of the whatever. But it's, um, oh, okay, great. There's your Instagram. Um, it's coming out nice. It's like multi, 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 very impressionist kind of design. Um, but it's very fun to do. I mean, doing a latch even as large as that, you could easily get that done in a day. If you were doing that and listening to mystery books on cassette, be easily accomplished. Um, sure, no problem. Um, I just want to remind you because he was out of focus yesterday, Native Tom, there are so many orders for him. It's crazy. I'll probably get 10 of the orders out today. I've been dying and I looked at the wool that I dyed overnight for it because he has real specific colors and three of them were not punchy enough. So they're in there now um, soaking up the last of the dye and I'll put them out in the sun to dry and, and get the rest of them out tomorrow. Peas and corn. Carol, I re-dyed the peas and the corn. So you have a package for me coming with at least three different things. Um, but no peas and corn. <laughs> so um, what we were doing yesterday was we were beginning to talk about fine artists, um, not contemporary fine artists, but, you know, from the earlier 20th century, late 19th century, who crossed over into rug hooking, at least for part of their career. Now, it is, um, it is, I'll show you in just a second. It's not a book today. This was another rabbit hole kind of thing. The thing that got me going on this was this antiques magazine. So I showed it yesterday. I want to show it again because we were so pixely. Um, uh, antiques magazine, January, February, 2011. I ordered it because like I said yesterday, sometimes you get a clue on eBay that there is an article about rug hooking and I had no idea what the article was. It just was, uh, you know, vases, comma, Wedgwood, comma, rug hooking, comma, and that was all I got. But I ended up ordering it because I wanted to know and this particular article is about Marguerite um, Zorick, who was a very, not as well known as she should have been, but she became quite well known in her lifetime. Um, I'm going to start with the article. So a little bit of what I do is going to be out of order, but I want to share her with you. And I also want to frame this talk by saying this this article really got me going because it got me looking at her as an artist. And you know how artists, whether you consider yourself an artist or not, I'm sure you are, but there is a lot of crossover to other stuff. Whether we're talking about arts or crafts, um, you know, crafts are thought to be sort of the more mechanical of the arts and crafts, you know, things that you do that are a bit more mechanical than 100% creative, uh, which doesn't mean that rug hooking is not creative. It just, there's that fine line always between the difference between an art and a craft. Just like when we were saying about Norman Rockwell, there's that fine line between an illustrator and an artist. It's always going to be there. But with any art or crafts person, um, there is always, you know, I can't think of many exceptions, some kind of a crossover, painting and sculpture or writing and painting or knitting and hooking or quilting and hooking. You know, you normally are so inspired um, by many things if you are a creative person. And sometimes one medium isn't enough to express the way that you feel or the thing that you're seeing in your head. You want to realize it in exactly the same way that it's in your head. And sometimes that's hard to do with the same medium all the time. So you do get, oh, I'm not, I don't even want to say trends because it's not a trend. You do get the reality of artists trying different mediums often um, just to see, you know, the pendulum swings and you're feeling it this day and you're not feeling it this day and ebbs and flows. And, you know, suddenly you can't stand the way your hook looks or your rugs look uh, and you want to get out the paintbrush instead. And it's just the way it is when you're a creative person. You should always follow so this article is about her, and I did a lot more research on her. I've got a few artists I want to talk about, so this will probably be a multi-day theme. Um, I started going, you know, on the internet and reading everything I could about her, and there's a lot because she was quite well known. Um, we'll leave it at that as a cliffhanger because I'm going to tell you more about her in a minute. But um, one of the things I found on the, the internet was a great article um, by Susan L. Feller, who is also on the. Uh, editorial board of Rug Hooking Magazine. 
she there was something online of hers um, that talked about fine artists, plural, not just Marguerite Zurich, uh, that also hooked rugs. So when I went to that, I found three more artists that I had to explore. Two of them I have explored a lot and I'm ready to talk about them. I don't know if I'll get to them today, but I might get to them tomorrow. Um, so I wanted to say a lot of what I'm doing is because Susan Feller put together a list of four artists who did this crossover that was very academic and um, super helpful because it's hard to figure this out on your own, even with the glorious internet. Um, Susan's article, which you can also find online, is really helpful. So I'm going to start with this antiques article because this is what brought me here. Now, I'm going to show you one of the rugs I used yesterday for the thing, what Marguerite's work looked like. And then I'm going to tell you about her extraordinary life. So this is one of her rugs. You can see very, very, very colorful. Can you see the birds and the shapes? It's not like anything that I've ever seen. This is another one. She did tons and tons and tons of nudes in painting, um, often herself. She was not, she was not shy. Um, she loved to do nudes of men and women. She did a beautiful, let me see if I can show you this beautiful close-up of her. I didn't see this picture anywhere else. Um, that's from like the 1930s or something. She's sitting with her son in that picture, I think. Um, beautiful, beautiful woman. So this piece that was on our, um, you know, our, our thing for the coffee time yesterday, the pixelated one, um, that is often, well, in this magazine, it's called Snake and Bird, but I've also um, heard the same piece referred to as The Jungle. So it's the same piece. I don't know why uh, different publications and different websites use two different names for it. But in any case, um, this article, and I'm going to be paraphrasing a lot because it's a longish article, but I just want to tell you the highlights about her and then talk more about her life from the sort of document that I made that pulls the stuff I found on the internet aside from Antiques Magazine. So it says uh, 20th century artist uh, Marguerite Zurich was both a collector and maker of hooked rugs. This is important because she loved hooked rugs so much. That was what gave her the idea that she wanted to try making them too at one point in her career. And I'll tell you why that's going to be exciting. Um, and, you know, her life is about 100 years after hooking is a thing. So it's not like she's coming at the way, way beginning. Uh, she's born in 1887. So and she dies in uh, 1968. So she's not at the beginning of rug hooking by any means. She is a super modernist. And it actually says in this magazine, her contributions to the art of the art form, meaning rug hooking, literally helped elevate hooked rugs from the floor to the wall. So in other words, until people were making rugs that looked like this and hanging in galleries, they, I mean, they, it was art underfoot, literally. Um, so she is going to be, if not the first, one of the first people um, who are all going to be women by the, from what I've learned so far, um, that will bring rug hooking, that will treat rug hooking as an art form um, and not so much a craft, not, a, not something utilitarian, but something that is meant to be proper art, uh, to be looked at and thought about. So this uh, article refers to a lot about an exhibit that was at the Farnsworth Art Museum in Rockland, Maine. Um, this was a couple of years ago, and I'm so sorry that I missed this uh, because it sounds amazing. We'll come back to that. But it said the show's guest curator uh, is an independent scholar named Mildred Cold Pelagieu. And we know her because she also did that fantastic Schiffer book. We'll look at that soon. Real thick book about rug hooking in Maine. Uh, I think it's like the 19 something like the 1930s to the 1950s or 1940s to the 1960s, something like that. Beautiful, comprehensive book. And she also did a beautiful uh, book that accompanied, um, I think, this exhibit called, also called Art Underfoot. There's a few things called Art Underfoot, so it can be confusing. Um, but by Mildred, um, it's on eBay right now for like $150, one copy. I would love to have that, but I'm not going to get it today. If you can, you should. It's going to be super good information. Um, but Mildred made a strong case that Maine was the center of the rug hooking phenomenon and, phenomenon, and it grew from its 19th century origins uh, into po a popular national activity. So, you know, we always think about Pearl McGowan as being the person and the pioneer who took rug hooking from nothing, um, from something that was becoming quickly extinct to something that, um, you know, people, hobbyists wanted to do and did do in great numbers. But this article is suggesting 
um, I'm, I'm sure quite rightly, that there were a lot of people who just weren't super, super prolific, that didn't do solely rug hooking for decades the way that Pearl did, you know, for 50, 60 years. Um, but they did a lot for rug hooking and they tend to go sort of unnoticed. Um, and that's what this series is gonna be about of the next couple of talks, because I think it's important to get these names out. I'll give you links. I said this yesterday, but we were pixelated and it wasn't worth it. We hadn't gotten, we hadn't dug in yet. I'm gonna give you some links uh, for websites and books that you might wanna check out because being a creative person, yes, there's we're talking about rug hooks, hook drugs today and looking at the hook drugs today, but you should see the art that these people did as well. You could see how easy the crossover is between rug and painting, um, super, super fluid crossover. So this article talks about uh, her early life a little bit. I showed you that beautiful nude about her collection, um, about how, I'm, I'm super paraphrasing, about how her husband, um, William Zorak, was a sculptor, and he was a very famous sculptor. Uh, her maiden name was Thomas, by the way, so it was Marguerite Thomas, and then it was Marguerite Zorak. She just dropped the Thomas. Um, they were obviously a very loving couple, super passionate about art, um, but he was very, very famous. And like um, anybody living at this time, the early 20th century, of course, when they had children, it came down to her. Um, it seemed like he was very present. Uh, you know, there's a lot of, um, he's in a lot of the paintings at home because her subjects will be family life. It's what she knows. It's not because she's a woman. It's not because she has a small world. It's not because she has a small imagination. It's because it's her reality is family life, domestic scenes. So that's what we see most of from her. They show us, um, they talk about their collection. They lived in this uh, beautiful farmhouse in Maine called Robin Hood Farm on Georgetown Island in Maine. And they collected Maine folk art, the two of them. And their house from the pictures I pulled up on the internet, I printed some exquisite, unbelievable, beautiful uh, folk art like none other. Just found rug hooking. I'm starting to forget. Oh, I'm so glad, Lori. The more you get into it, the more you love it. The more you get ensconced, it just grows and grows. So the Zuraks um, were huge collectors of folk art and particularly rug hooking on the walls and on the floor, all over the place. So these were a couple of rugs that she collected, that Marguerite collected. One is by Lucy Trask Barnard. Now this is another 1800 to 1896. So this, she dies right around the time that Marguerite's born. This is another important artist in rug hooking. We're gonna have some coffee times about her coming up too. This is one of her pieces. I mean, that's pretty extraordinary. I hope it's in focus there. And this is another one uh, that they had collected that's, I, I was gonna say just a geometric, but it's absolutely beautiful. If you look at the kinds of shading in it, one is very simple and folky. Um, the Lucy uh, Trask Bar Barnard is, is over the top impressionistic, um, fluid and beautiful. So yeah, so the reason that Marguerite picked up rug hooking um, and did less and less painting was because she had a boy and a girl and life was busy and ultimately the weight of the household fell on her. And she said many times that she just found it easier um, to rug hook. It was something she could keep on her lap. She could in a snap pick it up and, and go to the children. Um, it wasn't something that required her complete concentration and a lot of supplies and her to be in a different space or outside. She found it easy to be a mother and to have the rug hooking on her lap as often as possible. And I thought that was an interesting insight that she'd said it so many times um, over all these articles that I've been reading that that would be her main reason for going to it. She also said that she found um, that the range, the, the sort of richness and range of color hues that she was looking for, she couldn't get with paint, the richness and the depth. She felt that she could only get them with wools and silks. So she hooked with things other than wool. She hooked with clothing. Um, but when she wanted to hook with something really intense and rich, she would go to like a silk. Um, so that's another interesting angle on what she was thinking when she got into it. She's also, you know, Marguerite, I mean, as exquisite of an artist as she is, she, um, her fame was certainly overshadowed her entire life by her famous husband, uh, the sculptor. It was also overshadowed by her daughter, uh, Dalev Ipkar, who is a very famous 20th century artist. She just died a few years ago at like 99 or something like that. 
super, super, super famous and artistic as well. And in Marguerite's lifetime, her daughter was very famous. So she as like the sort of matriarch of the house, exquisite painter, had a lot of gallery shows. I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, very well known, very well respected, but still being surpassed in her lifetime by her husband and her daughter. Um, and, and she had absolutely no hard feelings about that. This is um, a beautiful um, embroidery slash hooked rug. It's, it's more like a yarn rug. It has a lot of sewing on top by her daughter. And it's called, no, no, no. Th this is by Marguerite. I take it back. This is of her daughter by Marguerite. This is one of her embroideries because you'll see if you research her, there are books of just her embroideries, Marguerite. So rug, hook, rug hooking, yes, embroidery also. Uh, and it's the Ipcar family. So this is her daughter. This is an embroidery with yarn. This is her daughter. And this is what their house was like. The red linoleum floor, the glimpse of Maine out the window, the laundry line running through the door. I don't think you can see it, but this laundry basket still has a tag on it that says Sears, like Sears catalog. The chaos of the children, uh, the house, you can see even the husband's giving a hand here. And um, and um, here she is. What's her name? Da, da, I keep messing it up. Dalov right here. They had exotic names for main people, right? Um, but I mean, just the chaos of family life. So um, she continues uh, as she gets older with the children being grown and out to do scenes of domestic life and to have that be one of her themes. She did a rug, her earliest hooked rug that Marguerite did was in 1917 and it was called Eden. I think I have a picture of it. Let me see if I can get that. Yep, this is it. It was called Eden. Um, and it was after a mural by the way, Marguerite and her husband, William, besides him being a sculptor and her being a painter, they did a ton of murals. And her daughter, Dalev, will do tons of murals too. But they did tons of murals. And many of those murals became hooked rugs. And this is one of them. So um, this is Eden. And they did, um, they painted this mural. It doesn't say what it was for originally in when they lived in New York um, early in their marriage. So before kids... Um, they did a mural that is somewhere. I haven't figured that out yet. And then she did this hooked rug after it. I'll try to hold it still. Wondering why it says T. That might be a stupid question. Of course, her maiden name is Thompson. Um, but I'm wondering, super colorful, super passionate, um, a little bit erotic with the snake. You know, it's just, it's it. she is a modernist, right? Um, talk about bridging the gap for a woman in the early 20th century. Um, she is a super, super modernist, and she's going to bring modernism into hooked rugs because the kind of hooked rugs you're seeing are these and also pastoral scenes, um, but not Adam and Eve. That's really, really pushing it. So this article goes on. I'm watching the time because we're going to come back to this tomorrow. Um, to some other other um, rugs that she did, this is one of them. I don't know if this copy is better or the other. By the way, this is her. Um, this is Marguerite here as a little bit of an older woman. And this is the one I'm going to show you. It's also in the magazine. This is one that she hooked a little bit later in life. And again, this one's in the antiques magazine that I'm looking at. Beautiful, beautiful colors. So let me just show you because she's a collector and a maker. Um, she hooks this one on top in 1944, the pig. And then 1920, she bought this one. So this is what she bought it in 20. Um, so it's probably about 1920 itself. This cat, this is one that she collected. So that's not by her. That's one that she had up in her house. This is one that she made, right? So she's making it in a different style, but you can see that push for modernism, almost like the French Paris cat, you know, that's kind of sitting up on his haunches, super, super um, identifiable and, and connected to Momar in that sort of school. And then this is another one that she made of a cat surrounded by birds. So really amazing, amazing work. And it's funny because um, I was just reading, let me see if I can find it. Her daughter-in-law, Peggy. So Peggy married her son, um, says that she remembers when her mother made her last rug, which is the pig. So that's gonna be Marguerite's last rug. She made it in 1944, and she says she recalls that the purple fruits and flowers uh, um, were from a cast-off sweater from a friend, like in the neighborhood, and the watermelon in the, in the design was made from her old uh, bathrobe that she was going to get rid of. So the purple flowers, I think they're easier to see in the magazine one. 
it's much richer with the magazine picture and then her old bathrobe. So she's doing just what people that were hookers a hundred years earlier than her were doing that was using cast off stuff. I'm gonna wrap it up in a second, but just let me show you the end of this article. This is their house, Robin Hood Farm. She painted on the walls of the house, like as if it were wallpaper, she and her daughter. Can you see this? That's not wallpaper. That's thousands of these hand paintings. They spent like, it was like one um, summer and they just went crazy and painted like all of the walls. And then you've got some sort of matching hooky pillows. But this is Robin Hood Farm. I'll have to figure out whether it's open to the public now because she, I mean, the whole family is very famous. Um, and now that um, Dolov is, has passed away herself, I'll have to check the status of that. Let me know if you know. Uh, a pig's breakfast. Good one, Carol. Definitely a pig's breakfast. But I have a lot more to say about her because her, Marguerite's, um, um, sort of start as an artist and as a woman uh, at the end of the 19th century was not traditional uh, and not easy. So we'll talk about her more tomorrow. And then I'm going to maybe transition to um, Blanche Levette, who's another great um, modernist artist who hooked drugs. And I also want to talk about Emily Carr, but I don't expect to get that far tomorrow. So we will continue talking about women, fine artists, modernist style you know, fine art women who hooked rugs and see how far we get. It's just too good to rush these kinds of things because there's so much information. I'm going to put some links up for you. And um, otherwise, I know, right, Crystal, everybody in Canada knows Emily Carr. She's so famous. Um, and Patrice says, as an illustrator and mural artist, I do nudes of my mom on linen. Um, we never got to hook. Never say never, right? What about the ability to transfer existing art? Saw hooked rugs of a hundred great. Um, and if you mean copyright, if uh, in terms of copyright, let's uh, I'll start there tomorrow. I'll make a note for myself because it's going to depend on uh, who the artist is and the age of the artist. Um, I'll definitely get into that tomorrow. There, there are a surprising amount of uh, famous works of art that are copyright free. Of course, if a certain age goes by. Um, depending on what art it is too, right? Music is different than painting, uh, is different than writing. Um, but if the family has maintained the estate, you know, if the estate of the artist has maintained the copyright, then it will always be a problem as long as that's in place. But we can start there tomorrow because, um, yeah, that question comes up a lot. So back tomorrow with Marguerite Zorak, and hopefully we get into uh, Blanche Levette too because, yeah, you've got, you've got a lot to look forward to. Have a great day, everybody. I'll see you in the morning.